This video contains content that viewers may find disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back to 100 Horrible Ways People Can Die. I'm John. And I'm Alex. Today is the second part of our two-part episode on freezing to death. And if you liked our last one, you'll definitely want to tune in for this one. That's right, because this time we're talking about some American history that involves George Washington and his group, right? Yeah, no more Canadian history. Now it's real American Yeah, history. instead of the Canadian Hudson, we're going to be talking about American, U.S. American. And it's fitting that we do so. Today is actually the day before Memorial Day. That's right. I don't know when the show will air, but I figure a good way to honor our troops is to tell a story that nobody really knows about the Revolutionary War. That's right. So give us a little history behind it before we go into our story. So what is the Revolutionary War? It's a the, war. Too, too, too much history. Yeah, it's a yeah, war. Okay. Everybody knows Valley Forge, right? Or yeah. Most people know yeah. Valley Forge, the winter of 1776. 77, wasn't it? 70, 76? 76 into 77, right? Yeah. No, was it? I think it was. I don't even know, to be honest. I, I'm honestly, I'm horrible at loss. I can't remember if it was 60, 76 into 77 or 77 into 78. Whatever, one of the two. Somewhere around there. U.S. fortunes were not doing good. They had just lost some battles. And they retreated, right? Yes. They, they camped in Valley Forge outside right. of Philadelphia, which eventually we'll take a trip to. I think maybe we'll get some history there we'll firsthand. See. And over 2,000 of the 10 plus thousand troops died, mostly because of disease. It wasn't apparently a very bad winter. It was just an average winter. But for some reason, history remembers it as being a really bad winter. But the winter of 79 was a really bad winter. And at this point, there had been a lot more development in the war. You know, you had the Battle of Princeton and Trenton. And some now it's other Morristown, battles. right? New Jersey. Yeah, so they had camped in the winter of 79, decided to camp outside of Morristown, New Jersey. Right. Which was considered a strategic location because it was halfway between New York City and Philadelphia, which were two of the bigger cities at that point, two big battles in the war. Yep. And that winter was apparently the coldest winter recorded in American history, I think to this day. And the stories are that, for example, the harbor in New York City froze and you could walk between Manhattan and Brooklyn. And just for comparison, normally that doesn't even have any ice in it. And was uh, was Benedict Arnold uh, a traitor at this point yet? I believe. Had he yes. had been court-martialed I, already I by this time? I believe Benedict Arnold did his stuff in 79. So it would have been that summer. So it was so right just after coming this. Off that, yeah. yeah. Just coming off of that? Yes, just coming off he of He would that, have just right? been so tried and executed, I think. Was it the... So I know he got court-martialed and was just reprimanded by Washington. And then... He literally betrayed the country, and then he was executed. Well, there's I a think, long history there. I to can't be honest, remember. I don't remember this, all the details. Can't remember where this happened, but you guys should look this up. It gets interesting. Yes, that's always something worth looking into. And I'll do some research because I don't remember, to be honest. I'm sure, my second grade history teacher probably like smack me now. That's right, mine too. I just remember something about that yeah. around that time period. But uh, shall we get into it? Let's do it. All right. As a young boy in the countryside, I bid farewell to my idyllic childhood when I finished school at just eight. My newfound freedom was, however, quickly consigned to Jeremiah's dairy farm, where I labored for a decade until the day I swapped the fields for the battlefield. The Continental Army's banner became my refuge, their cause my calling, and their struggle my new reality. In the biting winter of 1777, we established camp in the area you know today as Valley Forge. Our tents were pitched amongst the merciless cold, an enemy as relentless as our British adversaries. That winter was a ruthless reaper, harvesting many a life, mostly due to disease. Despite the odds, we soldiered on, our spirits unbroken. By 79, the Army's footprint marked the lands of Jockey Hollow, outside Morristown, New Jersey. Having survived Valley Forge, we braced ourselves for another season of frostbitten torment. But this winter wasn't merely a repeat, it was a remorseless sequel, bringing an onslaught we had never envisioned. The cold was an unforgettable villain, a chilling antagonist far colder than the coldest story spun. I witnessed the ground freeze in November, surrendering its verdant mantle to an icy shroud, which refused to retreat until April. The ruthless winds seemed like an army of invisible ghosts, slashing at our bodies, leaving us shivering in their wake. Among the many casualties that winter was my closest comrade, Jebediah, a man whose courage was as warm as the fireside tales we'd once shared. His memory now resides within the icy embrace of the snow, 
a monument to our shared struggle. As the new year dawned on January 3rd, so too did a relentless snowfall. The skies released an incessant barrage that lasted for days, encasing us in a world as white as a maiden's wedding dress. I had never seen such a spectacle, a tempest of wind and snow so relentless it could reshape the landscape to the height of a man's shoulder. Our existence inside our cabins was like dwelling inside a restless beast. The wind howled its mournful song through every crevice, and our only defense was a humble fireplace and a dwindling pile of logs. We banked the fire, a reluctant truce with the biting cold, to conserve our meager wood supply. In the dark, sleep proved elusive. The echoes of my past adventures stirred my mind. I remembered my young adulthood when I first encountered the might of a steam locomotive, that black behemoth that roared and belched smoke like a creature from a nightmare. Now, with the howling wind resonating through our cabin, it felt as though we'd been swallowed whole by that same monstrous beast. By the second day, hunger gnawed at our bellies, our provisions were exhausted, and one of the men was driven to such desperation he proposed eating his shoe. We managed to persuade him otherwise, but the specter of starvation loomed menacingly over us. On the third day, the snow ceased its relentless onslaught, providing us the opportunity to break free from our icy tomb. We ventured forth, weakened and exhausted, to clear the camp, only to uncover a chilling discovery. Buried in a neighboring cabin were Jebediah and a few others. Their cabin had succumbed to a massive snowdrift, sealing them in an icy prison from which there was no escape. After we managed to clear the entrance, we were met with a haunting scene. Stepping into the cabin felt like crossing into another realm. Icicles dangled menacingly from the ceiling the wind hissing through cracks in the hastily built walls. A layer of snow carpeted the floor, a testament to the failing roof that had given way under the merciless barrage of the storm. In the dim light, we made out the cold, lifeless form of Jebediah. His body, once bursting with vitality, was now as cold as the snow that blanketed him. His hands and face bore the terrible scars of frostbite, a grim reminder of the battle he'd fought against the ruthless cold. Survivors remained in the cabin, though their spirits were as fractured as their bodies. Over the following weeks, one man would surrender both his legs to Frostbite's cruel grip. The others, racked by illness, would endure the winter, holding on to life by a thread. As we pressed forward, we discovered more men who had succumbed to the winter's brutal assault. Their graves, carved from the frozen earth with blunt shovels, stood as a testament to their sacrifice. But amid the losses and hardships, there was a gritty determination that stirred within us. Remembering our defeats, our victories, and our trials, we pledged to overcome, no matter the cost. Despite the grim toll of a hundred lives from over 10,000, we thank God for sparing us from the plagues that had marred our previous encampments. In its own cruel way, the cold had shielded us from the scourge of disease, becoming an unlikely ally in our struggle. Inspired by the trials of Joseph Plum Martin, who enlisted in the Continental Army at the tender age of 15, this tale is a tribute to the resilience and courage of men who weathered the worst of winters for the promise of freedom. His voice was later discovered in the 1950s, a living testament to our shared history and a reminder of the unyielding spirit of our great nation. Well, that was a story, right? That was a story. And uh, while it was, I think, completely fictional in the sense that that specific event didn't based happen. Based on a real life It's event, based on a right? real story. And there's actually a book that was lost to history that was refound, I think, in the 50s. Yeah. Um, we'll put the name up on the screen here. But it's, Maybe we will. Sometimes we forget to put things on the screen. We'll never know. You'll find out. Eventually. We'll find out eventually. But <laughs> it's a first-hand account of the Valley Forge incident. It's a, a, the winter there. It has the Morristown encampment as well, and a lot of other historical events from the perspective of a private who went through almost every single battle in the Revolutionary War. Oh, he was in all of them. Yep, almost all of them. Man, he joined he at the age a lot of, of misery. Fifteen or sixteen after Lexington and Concord. Jeez, kids mentally Only scarred. He got out of there. He lived till about 80 or so. Whew. So he lived quite a long time. That old geezer was mentally scarred. Well, he got out of that stuff. Times were different back then. That's true. They just washed it away with whiskey. Or 
whatever they had back then. <laughs> whatever. I didn't even have any whiskey at <laughs> the time. Know. Applejack. It's probably more accurate. Okay. Interesting note. Lost to history was the Whiskey Rebellion. Maybe we can talk about that sometime. Yeah, maybe we should. The People first... died in that too. Oh, yeah. And it wasn't from whiskey. Not from whiskey. Yeah. Anyway. More from bullets, I think. Probably. What's more interesting, I think, is from a historical point of view, how impactful winter was on, or has been on history, and how many wars have actually been decided by winter. Yeah, World War II is real big with uh, the Russian II, front, right? Even World War One. to World some degree. World War One. Uh, the Napoleonic Wars, where Napoleon lost a good 30 to 40 percent of his troops, timing, if not more. Attack during winter. Right. And of course, there's the Russian saying, our best general is General Winter. General Winter, That yeah. saved their ass a couple of times. Yeah. And there's other wars, too. The Punic Wars, Hannibal crossing the Alps, yeah. lost over 30 percent of his troops. A lot of times, a lot, a lot of, of his those troops did not make the, even, the Alps. Even the troops that didn't make it, you know, sometimes they would just, they would get really bad frostbite. They would mm -hmm. just have to cut off a limb. Right. And the way they'd cut off their limb is, is they literally just tourniquet and then just take a saw and yeah. just cut it off with a rope in their mouth, right. you know, gashing teeth. Well, even, even just not. Gnashing teeth? Gnashing. Not gashing. Na gnashing. Gnashing of teeth. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Even something like frostbite, even if you survived, you'd probably get gangrene under right. those conditions because it's not very hygienic. That's right. And that's actually what happened in Valley Forge in 1776 or 7, I don't remember. But that's what happened to a lot of the soldiers. They got disease from the winter conditions, the lack of poor hygiene, not even, not even Nothing for wrong. example, having yeah. good retreats. They right. got infections and <clears throat> yeah and an infection was a death sentence under those conditions you'd have a 50 percent chance to die from one and there's you know i don't know about starvation but i'm sure there was a lot there of people some that starvation starved too. yeah morristown because they I mean, talked about them chewing on their boot soles and stuff like that yes. eating tree bark they were so hungry that's you know? actually almost deserted that account from that book that right? i found yeah they almost almost every like a lot of people were talking about deserting because they yes. just needed to get out of the winter and people did desert but yeah. part of the problem with deserting was okay you have no food you have no supplies where are you going okay good yeah. luck with that yeah there were people and again we're not historians so we don't know all the full effects of this but there were people obviously sympathetic to the revolutionary causes especially at that point in the war who were helping the troops while they were encamped providing them with food but even then i i heard or read that there were some hostilities between people about that and people weren't happy you know we just were revolting against the british partially because they would put us they would put their soldiers in our houses and that's why we have one right of our, Third Amendment, Sixth Amendment. Um, no, not the Sixth Amendment. Third Amendment. You can't house troops in the. Yeah, not without permission. I, I can't remember which geez, one it it's is. One of the, it's in the Bill of Rights. I don't remember which number it was. Which is horrible of me, but whatever. But that's literally something that you put into your constitution eventually because of the experiences with the British and American troops were. There's a lot of horror stories there, and one of the best horror stories I've heard about that is actually somebody in our family, one of your ancestors. Stop right there. This conversation has gone on long enough. Now freeze. Ten minutes later. Yeah, so he was never the same after that. It was just a horrendous thing. It's amazing your family has those records going back all that history. Yeah, it goes yeah. all the way back uh, to the Mayflower, our history. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty impressive. It's pretty crazy. I'm sure our viewers would, would love to hear that story in more detail at some point. I mean, it was pretty detailed just now. So. Yeah, it's true. I don't think you'd ever want to talk about it ever again, right? Yeah, I'd rather not. Yeah, it's pretty personal. Yeah. Well, yeah. I oh, well. share sometimes. There you have it. Yeah. So uh, what, what else do we want to talk about? Any more wars? Any more uh, death by freezing? I mean, they're, they found animals like Flash Frozen before, right? Yes. You ever seen that movie Encino Man? Encino Man? Whatever it's pronounced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen Frazier, that. I think. I think I've seen that. Or I've heard of it at least. Heard of it? It's like Jurassic Park, but with cavemen, basically. Were they Flash Frozen and they just came out? Yeah, I mean, we found remains of humans and That's animals. not going to happen. They're not going to live if that if that guy lived in the movie. Well, supposedly, there's still woolly mammoths that are perfectly preserved, that they can clone or one day Oh, or clone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They could probably clone. They're basically clone. Flash Frozen. But yeah. I think what happens is when you're frozen, water expands. And since your body's 75% mm -hmm. water... Every every molecule expands and, and things pop. So right. you know if you ever put a banana in the freezer, and then take it out, even if it's a beautifully ripe, perfect banana, it's going to be bruised and ruined when you take it out of the freezer and let it thaw because of the water expansion. That's why we don't have any type of cryogenic like really freezing yeah, that's people one to of the come back. Of right. But again, depending on the process, there are yeah. animals that can freeze because there they, are. they yes. have fish, for example, have quote-unquote antifreeze and they have like glycol or some sugars in their body that sure 
help but prevent the water from freezing. Do you think that when they're frozen in the water, do you think the, the fish is actually frozen or do you think that it's just can't move? I don't know. Well, I guess we'll Sounds never like find out. a question out. for a different episode. We'll have to ask the fish. Yeah. Or whatever <laughs> fish do. I don't know. I don't know what fish do. Fish make all right, sounds. Well, I think that's all we got for today. Yeah, I think right? we're scraping the bottom of the barrel now. Yeah, all right. Well, all right. All right until next time, everyone, our next episode is going to be on being struck by lightning. Yeah, I guess being so. struck by lightning. Being struck by lightning. All right, until then, stay, stay safe, safe, out, stay safe there. out there.